Uh, as you know from all the literature, is one of the hottest trends in office today. Everyone's really interested in how you can supply lifestyle, and looking at that in an office context seems like an impossible feat to, uh, to, to achieve. But we actually have some folks here today who are achieving that, and so we're going to sort of look at what they're doing and how they're doing it, what the ROI is on that for investors, if it can be profitable and how so, and what some of the nitty-gritty is about it, as well as where things might go in the next five years. Uh, I'm going to moderate the discussion. My name is Jacob Nab. I'm the Director of Commercial Services at the Chicago Association of Realtors. And I know as soon as I said the word realtors, everyone stopped listening because we just do houses, right? Um, so the commercial forum is the, the commercial facing plank of the Chicago Association, and we only do commercial. I don't know anything about houses. And because I'm a young Gen Xer, I'll never own one. So I'm only here for commercial. Uh, basically, what we do is we provide a chance to do networking, education, advocacy, technology, and other important things that you need to make your business profitable and to grow your you know, client network. And so if you're interested in learning more about Commercial Forum, I'd be happy to tell you more about it afterwards. We have a couple of cool events that I'll plug super quickly, and then we'll move it along. Uh, on May 30th, we're doing a market update. We'll have Dr. Lawrence Yoon coming in to give an economic update about the commercial marketplace and what's happening nationally, if it's ending and when. Uh, and then we'll do sort of a boots on the ground, look at the local market with each of the asset classes. So we'll have brokers that are working in office, retail, industrial, et cetera, saying what they're seeing in Chicago now, what they expect to be seeing this time next year. That's May 30th. Uh, again, if you sign up for my mailing list, you can learn about that. And then we're going to do an Opportunity Zone event on June 18th uh, with people who are actually investing in and developing in Opportunity Zones. It's not a bunch of lawyers talking about what might happen, but brokers and investors talking about what they're doing. So that might be a good one for you to attend as well. And again, ask me about that later if you'd like. Uh, at this point, I want to go ahead and turn it over. We have Mr. MVP here, actually. We were supposed to have two Jacobs on this panel, and I had so many meatloaf jokes ready for all the Jacobs and two out of three ain't bad and all that, and now they're all dead to me. But Kevin flew in, actually, like his arms are really tired because he just flew in from Colorado by way of Philadelphia, by way of I don't even know what, and he's leaving directly after this to go somewhere else. So he is MVP of the day. I'm declaring it now, uh, and he'll tell you more about himself. I, I appreciate the nice words, but I feel a little bit more like the, uh, maybe the JV squad here. I know you guys were expecting our, our CEO, Jacob Bates, so uh, what I lack in, uh, in his uh, credentials, I guess, I'll make up for in enthusiasm and, and warm smiles. So uh, th thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Anderson. I'm the director of membership development at Common Grounds. Uh, Common Grounds is a workplace as a service operator. We've been around for just two years. Uh, we just raised our Series A of $100 million uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, we've got five locations open now. We've got five opening in the next 60 days, and we've got uh, 10 more in development, and we should be about a million square feet by the end of 2019. Uh, I am from Philadelphia, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Again, apologies that I'm not the CEO, but I, I think I'm a little less serious and maybe a little more fun. No. <laughs> that was a very Jacobean introduction. I, yeah. I, think, I think it flies. Appreciate Mallory, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and Industrious? Yeah, hi, I'm Mallory Salette. Um, Kev, Kevin and I are up here trying to work on our posture, sorry. Um, I am an enterprise business development manager recently. Um, I've only been in this role for about a month, I, but I have been with the company for over four years. Um, so I've gotten to see Industrious kind of from the ground up. I started in our very first location right here in River North. Um, and when I started, we only had two. And we now have about 65 locations across, I think, 40 cities um, across the US. So we're growing like crazy. Um, I'm really excited just because I've, you know, I've seen us you know, talking about uh, workplace as a service. I've, I've seen us start off with hardly any services and now, you know, uh, an immense amount, so it's it's been really exciting, and I'm, I'm really excited to kind of share a little bit more with you guys today. I think that's a great point of entry, because workplace as a service is a fairly new term, and it also has all these other terms that are starting to glom onto it, like bespoke, which used to be like wedding dresses, and now is like office services. So I'm really curious to hear a little bit more about that, but I think before we talk about the particulars, why don't we talk about the definition for folks who maybe are just now hearing this catchphrase, or maybe this buzzy idea. How do you define workplace as a service? And maybe since you all are a little more established in the field, we can hear from you first, Mallory. Yeah, it definitely is a buzzword right now. Um, but so I think basically what we're doing, and you know, I can chat with people individually, but I'm sure we'll get into the types of services that we offer as a company. But you know, what we're what we're doing is basically, you know, the companies out there are looking to purchase something. They want to purchase, um, you know, business outcomes. They want to get top talent. All of these different things. And basically, what they're doing is they're investing in companies like us to provide the ingredients to um, for their employees to be happy and you know have a great day a great experience at work so I think what we're trying to do you know I always say unless you're working at you know 
Google or Facebook and you happen to be in the headquarters of, of those uh, companies, um, you're going to need kind of an expert to kind of provide the services in which, um, you know, your employees need to kind of have a good day at work. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. Our mission is, you know, making people proud and excited to come to work. And that's everything from, you know, facilities management to hospitality services, uh, flexible leases, all of these different types of things. So it's more than just, um, it's more than just real estate as a, an item. And now it's more of a, a product, I guess, if you will. Yeah, I think that a, a great thing to kind of add on to that would be, you know, a lot of the companies that were that are adopting this product so quickly are the folks that are spending tens of millions of dollars on their headquarters, and they're growing so rapidly, and they don't want to take on these long-term debts and these long-term obligations for uh, real estate in large markets where they need the talent. But they also don't want to send their folks, you know, bring them to the headquarters for their indoctrination, and then send them off to a sort of a second-class product where they feel like a distant relative or a second-class citizen. So it's about providing not only the the fixtures and the infrastructure that is you know similar to or in some cases you know uh, better than the the Silicon Valley headquarters, but also the you know the buzzword of the experience, right? How can we amenitize this and and create the hospitality so that folks don't say, oh man, I wish I was working at headquarters. They actually feel you know lucky or privileged or or just you know empowered when they work at a place that's that's offsite because of the flexibility that it offers, because of the the community that it offers. Um, I think that's kind of it. Well, it does sound like a lot of what happens with workplace as a service has to do with consistency and the idea that, as you say, you don't have like the, you know, Yankee Stadium and in the Bush Leagues, right, where you're like, you're not really in the real stadium. You're playing in some crappy little place in Charleston, West Virginia. And the idea here is that we actually have the same kind of consistency across the board. How do you approach that? Because I would imagine that that's got to be fairly difficult to sell initially as an idea. So what are your strategies to sell consistent workplace experience? I actually, I actually don't think it's about how we can sell our consistent workplace experience. It's more about how can we adopt and change our product to align ourselves with your ideal workplace experience, right? So that word bespoke that you use. What can we do with the infrastructure of the spaces? What can we do with the technology that we have to make sure that we're not saying, okay, you know what? We're, we're a, a co-working operator and we're going to give you 45 square feet per person and we're going to stuff you in here and hopefully you like it. It's more about how can we have a strategic partnership where we match your corporate standards, we match your brand guidelines, and we provide a space for you and then you don't have to incur the debt and you don't need to put it on your balance sheet. So it's more about having a collaborative relationship with you know, the, the occupier or the end user rather than saying, here's, some, here's a few desks and a card table and a monitor, hopefully you like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. I completely agree. I think it's you know us saying, okay, here's 95% of a product. How can we fill up the rest of that 5% and customize it to you and your company culture, your company goals, um, and really kind of make it their own. I think that would probably speak directly to landlords and people who are owning these spaces in the first place and running them. So it's interesting. Do you, do you see changes in strategy for landlords, property managers, etc., when you're talking about this kind of idea of customization and working with the end user? Yeah, I think the the conversation has changed completely um, a, a lot, and I think especially since 2015, I feel like it's just really kind of taken off. But um, there's a bunch of different types of conversations that we're having. I think one of them is, you know, there are landlords who are like, oh, this is making sense. Like, why am I not doing this myself, you know? Um, and I think some of them out there are, and some are succeeding, but a lot of them are saying, okay, this is more than I, I thought it was going to be. I've kind of bitten off more than I can chew. Who's the, uh, you know, how can I form an exclusive partnership with someone to come in and manage the space for me? And that's like a whole another conversation because now we're turning into these, I keep looking at you, Jenny, sorry, these two, these uh, management uh, partnership agreements versus, you know, traditional leasing, so. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. You had this, you know, this enormous co-working boom in 2008 and uh, owners and asset owner and landlords weren't really, concerned with it. They were happy to have people come in and fill their vacancy and pay $50 a foot and didn't really care that they were charging the end user two or three times rent because it wasn't really their, their core group of customers. They didn't really care that the, the freelancers in the gig economy were going to be coming into this building. But as the, you know, the global 2000 and, the, and the, the rapid growth startups are starting to adopt this product, landlords are going, wait, 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 wait a second. I have a competitor inside of my building now. So they're looking the way, like Mallory said, to uh, form partnerships with operators like ourselves because they want to provide that product for their end user, but they're not traditionally experienced or really have the inclination to even become good at it. They just want somebody to come in, do it for them, and give them a slice of the revenue. And that way, if you have a company like, you know, I, I don't know, IBM who wants to move 
out of your stack and into a flexible workplace operator inside of your building, they're happy to do it because they're not going to lose you know, a significant amount of revenue. They're not going to lose that blue chip credit attendant to somebody inside of their own building. So it sounds like there's a bit of risk, risk mitigation happening here, right? Where you're offering workplace as a service as a way of, of mitigating that risk and reducing that risk. Is that accurate? Oh, absolutely. O on both sides, too, right? So it's mitigating our risk as the operators because the, the owners will subsidize our rent or increase free rent or whatever. Um, but it's mitigating their risk as well because they're providing a wider product offering for their end users. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, well... No, no, you're totally fine. I completely agree. You kind of took the words out of my mouth. So what are some of the challenges? I mean, as you said, there's a big boom initially in co-working, and now there's a boom in workplace as a service, and the two kind of go hand in hand, right? But they're also happening very rapidly, and some people are trying to do it in-house, and others are going out, and we're seeing a lot of different companies. Even in Chicago, a lot of square footage is being gobbled up right now by these kinds of service providers. And so what are the risks that they face as they look to expand and increase their footprint? Are you talking about, who, when you say they, who are you talking about? Well, I mean, just general mm -hmm. industry professionals who mm -hmm. maybe are looking to work with service providers or yeah. maybe are looking to start their own shops. Um, the risks, I mean, I think there's, when they're looking at, like, their own going direct to a landlord or, or something like that, I think, you know, back in the day, these companies were expected to plan out the next 10 years of their, you know, their, their, their ten year plan, and especially I mean ten years is huge it 's insane, and so I think something that has really kind of i don 't think i 'm answering this question correctly, but I think something you know a risk with doing that is people you know it's it 's ridiculous to expect someone to know you know next year, especially in this day and age with the technology and how fast everything is going it 's like ten years is like a lifetime from now, so going into a direct lease or like a more traditional lease like that. Is a, is a huge risk. And so I think something with like what Kevin and I are offering is you know mitigating that by telling them, listen, you're not gonna be locked into anything long term. It is super flexible for you. And we, as a partner with you, can help you grow your company. We can help you downsize. You know, we really wanna be like a consultative you know, partner for these companies. Yeah, and, and just adding on to that, right, it's, it's great when people really understand that, but one of the challenges is, is education, right? What are the differences between co-working and workplace as a service? Why are we different? How can we change and adopt our facilities to match your brand? And, and the biggest challenge, I think, is just education on both sides, right? You've got occupiers who, you know, by and large have had the same exact process where, uh, you know, finance has really driven it and, and then real estate is driven it. Okay, we want to be in Chicago. Let's find a place that fits our budget and then try to fill it. And now there's sort of an operational correction where HR is saying, we need 50 people in Chicago, um, you know, and we want to, and they're saying to finance, this is how much it's going to cost. And they're, and they're telling real estate, okay, now find us a place to go there. So the, one of the bigger challenges is kind of educating people who have been in the industry, both on the demand side and the supply side, of you know, what this product is and how it's different. Because you've got people who have worked in real estate transactions for 25 years, who have made the same transactions over and over and over again, pretty templatized. But then you also have asset owners who are the wealthiest asset class on planet Earth, and you're telling them, oh, we want you to make money differently now. So the biggest thing is educating the occupiers on what the difference is between co-working, which typically has a negative connotation of being fratty and flimsy and a place where you really know if you fit in or, or not, uh, and what the difference between that is and work workplaces as a service is, which is more of a like we're talking about more of a consultative approach of how we can change the fixtures of the building to match your corporate standards. I would love to sort of double down on this exact train of thought for a moment. I mean, I think it would be helpful to talk from your all's perspective as providers, what is the difference between co-working and workplaces as service? Because the language around it has begun to shift over the last couple of years, and I think a lot of people just use the words because everyone's using them. Yeah. yeah, I think there is like a stigma around co-working and as Kevin mentioned, education is a huge part of it. That's one of the challenges of, I think, our jobs is, you know, we, we're we not just catering to small tech startups of, you know, two people or more anymore. We do have, like, larger enterprise companies that are coming to us. And when the, you know, the associates on these enterprise teams are coming in and exploring co-working to then bring to the decision makers, it's our job to tell these decision makers of these enterprise companies, listen, Co-working is not what you think it is. It's, you know, it's something that, it's the way the world is going. And I think, um, what was the, the end of that question? Well, just basically, like, workplace as a service is a buzzword. Yeah. But what actually does Industrious right. offer? Right, yes. Yeah. So basically, the point of that is when they think about co-working, they think of an open space, a giant cafeteria where people are coming with their laptops, and that's completely 
completely changed. We do still have some of those things in some of our locations, but you know, we started there, then we listened to the demand of the market, and we sl slowly started to move into smaller private offices. And then from there, for example, in River North, Pinterest was one of our first members there. Started in one office, then they grew and grew and grew. Their headquarters in San Francisco wanted them to move out and get their own space. One of my favorite stories, they didn't want to, so we grew with them and we built out a beautiful suite for them on our seventh floor. And those are the types of things, that's the demand that we're starting to get now. And those are the, thing, the image that we're trying to change. It's not just a cafeteria with a laptop. I'm gonna kind of answer your question about buzzwords with some more buzzwords. But um, I think the main differentiator is that last word, which is service, right? Co-working is traditionally, I'm going to build a place to my standards or to what I can afford or what I want my margins to be, and hopefully you all will fill it. Workplace as a service is something that has, you know, a little bit more of a service component to it, but a little bit more of a consultative approach where, yes, we are going to build our flagship locations, sorry, <clears throat> our flagship locations that, you know, um, are going to be in the major MSAs, but we're kind of enabling the technology and the, the infrastructure with some demountable wall systems, with higher grade furniture, so that we can match the corporate standards of the end users much more closely and not just say, like I said earlier, hey, hopefully you guys like it, you know, you, you need it for two years. And something that you were talking about, I think, is a key component of workplaces and services. How can we help these people who are in these rapid growth startups who have gone from an office manager of a 100 person office to the head of real estate with 5,000 people, how can we help them make transactions that are new in the industry and how can we educate them on where they should go and why they should not take down a lease in that market and why it would be more feasible for them uh, both financially and from a strategic planning perspective you know, to work with a common grounds or an industrious to help source that location and provide the amenities and provide the infrastructure so that they've just got one line item on the operating expenses rather than a large capital expense a 10-year debt, so on and so forth. Is that, is this making sense, everybody? I feel like I'm talking in circles a little bit sometimes. Same here. <laughs> no? <laughs> no? It's a very, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's a similar model. I think, you know, we have memberships as well. Um, I think, you know, when I'm giving my tours and I'm talking to people about how we're different, I, I always say you need to go and explore. It's like, you know, investing in a house. You need to find the one that speaks to you. Um, industrious, for example, one of the things that we see, like really pride ourselves on, we always say the heart of our company is our hospitality. And so what we do there is we invest in this staff that is on site every single day getting to know members on a personal level as much as they'll let us, um, finding out what's driving their business and anticipating their needs. So I have Katie Franks over there. Katie, raise your hand. She's been the community manager at River North for about two and a half years. Um, she knows 95% of the people in that space. She can anticipate their growth needs. She can anticipate their lunch needs. Um, and basically, I, there's so many things that we do that I think really we provide a service but the hospitality is gonna be the biggest one. We also do services like we're doing facilities management, we're managing your, your utilities and all of that stuff. We're doing networking events, we're hosting things you know, based on what our members wanna hear, doing internal and external events so people can, can grow their businesses with um, you know, facing the 65 other locations full of members there. So I don't know if that answers your question. So the, the question was, what's the difference between what we're doing and what WeWork is doing? Bluntly, there's not much of a difference in terms of how the interactions are with the, the, the people that are in the space every day. The differences are sort of the infrastructure and the facilities that are provided. H have you worked in a WeWork, sir? No. no? You've put people in a WeWork. How's their experience been? Have they been enjoying it? So part of that is, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to talk about differentiators and, and try to diminish the competition or anything mm -hmm. like that, but part of it is that your, your company, the companies in this space have your own corporate standards. You probably would not feel comfortable taking on a lease and providing your, your end users, your employees, 36 inch Ikea desks and putting them into sort of 45 square to foot a person. Mm -hmm. So it's more about how can I take an approach with you and provide a product that's enabled by technology, better infrastructure, 
has a more collaborative relationship with ownership so that I can provide you a higher quality experience but not have to charge you much, uh, a more significant dollar amount to work in that space. So at the end of the day, f flexible office is flexible office, but it's just about how can we work to provide you with the needs that you've established and make sure that your brand is going to fit inside of our space and the f space feels like yours, not somebody else's. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this making any sense? Yeah? So part of that is, you know, I know you guys are doing the same exact thing, is how can we use technology to have movable walls and how can we make it so that our space can change dynamically just like most of the business requirements of the large enterprise occupiers and the fast growth startups are changing at the same time. And then how can we use technology to kind of bridge those gaps as well? Is, it, is, is, that, is that making sense, sir? And I, 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 so everything that we're talking about here in terms of workplace as a service is very similar to co-working. It's a membership fee, it's not a, it's not a lease, it's not a long-term obligation. Yeah. It's a, it's a flexible membership. Yep. Yes, sir. Short-term license agreement versus a, a lease. What, what, what is it that makes this so popular financially? I mean, we're seeing growth here because, sure, it's hip and cool to be in a space with hip and cool people, right? Mm -hmm. And who doesn't like the idea of limiting or mitigating the amount of time you have to be in a space? If it's not working, you can do an Irish exit and you're good, right? <laughs> so these are things that everyone would theoretically like, but real estate centers on investment and finance, after all, and it's not going to work if it doesn't also make money. So I'm a little bit curious about that side of the coin. Like, why is so much of Chicago's office shifting in this direction? What are some of the financial, you know, from the landlord or the investor perspective, not the, not the occupier's perspective, what are some of the financial benefits of, of being involved in this kind of product? From a landlord perspective? Sure. Um, for, okay, for, for example, um, you know, we, okay, for example, in Scottsdale, we just opened a space in one of, in, I guess, Arizona's largest luxury mall. Um, I've never heard of it, but uh, I guess a lot of people in Arizona have in Scottsdale. Um, so that was a very new thing for us. Is, and I think um, an example for that is, the landlord, you know, we're developing these relationships and these partnerships with these landlords and we're going in as a partnership and so now this landlord is seeing the traction that it's getting. These people are working. The demand is obviously there because we're, we've only been there for, I think, three months and we're almost full. The people are coming in, the clients are coming in, not only are they shopping at the stores, but now this landlord is learning way more than they have and is gaining way more money than they did when Barney's was in there, you know? So as we continue to do these management agreements and these partnership agreements, I think that there's a huge opportunity f for more money to be made on, on both ends. Yeah, I, I think the reason, hello? I, I think the reason that landlords are starting to adopt this, uh, like you were saying, is because it's a sliver of the pie that they were otherwise not getting access to and not gaining uh, m money from. So like, like we were talking about before, the typical traditional model of co-working is you're the asset owner, I'm gonna pay you $50 a square foot, I'm gonna charge Mallory $150 a square foot. And that's two or three floors of your building that you are now saying, wait a second, the end user is gonna pay three times rent and I'm not getting any of that. So the reason that landlords are getting involved in this is because one, uh, they, they, they previously did not have access to that money and they're starting to realize that, holy cow, larger occupiers are starting to adopt this product because for them it makes financial sense as well. They're not going to be locked into a long-term agreement. They're not going to have to make business decisions 10 years out when they really have no clue. I mean, a year ago at Common Grounds, we were a dozen people, two dozen people, and now we're over 100. I think if you would have asked anybody a year ago how many people we had, they would have went, right? And I think in industries, it's probably the same boat, and I think a lot of people in this room are probably in the same boat. So how can we bridge that gap between asset ownership so that they're not losing out on the rent that they would otherwise get uh, if people could continue to make business decisions 10 years into the future, uh, how can they access a little bit more of that, that, uh, that monetary value? And then forming partnerships with the companies like, like us gives them access to that capital. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And, and, you know, you talk about what could happen in 10 years, and part of these kinds of events, of course, is spitballing about what the future might hold. You know, given the explosive growth of workplace as a service and this business model for office, what do you all see a few years down the line, if, if at all? You know, how does this growth continue to look over the next year or two? I, I think... That's such a tough question to answer, but um, I mean, I know. And we're filming it, so. Yeah, you know. I know. <laughs> like, is my CEO watching this? Um, I mean, I know we're optimistic. Um, I can see. I mean, there's what 400 co-working brands in the U.S. or something crazy like that. Um, I think the demand's gonna 
personally, I think the demand's gonna continue to go. I think what we will see, though, is um, a significant amount of like mergers and acquisitions, maybe. I think we're starting to see that already. Um, so I think as we continue to grow, some of them might drop out or you know combine, but that's what I'm kind of anticipating. So uh, I'm gonna take this in a little bit of a different direction in terms of like, well, five years ago, co-working was like we were speaking about, it's very cookie cutter. Uh, it doesn't have, it's very um, combative relationship with asset owners. I think in the next five years, I think you're gonna start to see even more of a, a collaboration between workplaces as service operators and asset owners to begin to activate the rest of the building. Um, you know, asset owners are starting to th realize that you know, they spent the last however many hundred years looking at the capital markets as their, as their customer, and now they're starting to look at the end user and how they can start to capture more money from their end user. So they wanna start to use operators like, uh, like us so that they can start to capture that you know, $200 a person that you spend per week within six blocks of your office. How can you combine with partnerships so that people won't want to leave the building as much, people can engage in the building more, people will spend more money in the building and go directly to the landlord's pockets you know, by way of a couple of partners. But I think you're starting to see people who begin to activate the building with technology, like the folks at Equium that spoke earlier today, uh, as well as partners like us, so that they can start to engage the tenants a little bit more and start to see the tenants and the members as more of their customer, not just the capital markets. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to give away the secret sauce or anything, but maybe as a sort of closing thought or final idea here, we could look at you know some of the ways that you all are hoping to change and improve what you're doing. This idea keeps getting expressed that keeping the tenant in the building, keeping the tenant engaged with the building is kind of a really big goal here for both property technology and also for the sort of soft software or service providers, right? So in providing workplace as a service, what are some of the things you all think you'll be able to do to keep tenants engaged in the building? What are some of the strengths you offer along those lines? I think all I can say is that the member experience and the member as a person is extremely important to us as a company. So um, yeah, without giving away the secret sauce, as you mentioned, I think it's just gonna be continued conversations, continuing to focus on what matters, which is the member experience, continue on building those personal relationships with the people that are trusting us to you know, provide them with a great day over and over and over again. So. We have an amazing hospitality team um, who takes a ton of time to sit down and get this feedback and listen and really implement what our members need in order to be successful at work. And I think that's just gonna, we're just gonna have to keep doing that. I think it's a lot more around the, the, the physical space as well that needs to change. I think if you look back to you know, the 1980s and you look at zoos, you had sort of the, the tiger sitting in the cage and now when you go to a zoo, it's, it's, I'm, I'm being serious. Now, now, now when you go to the zoo, it's a lot more matched to what their natural habitat and their natural environment should be. And if you look at the office space, traditionally, it's, it's like a cage for humans. I think if you were to, if you were to design a space that was meant to be the least productive space on planet Earth, you would probably design something that looked like a cubicle, right? Yep. Taupe colored walls, <laughs> right. tiny little boxes. So what can, what can we do with the design of the space to engage the people in the space more, providing more natural light, having those biophilic elements, having more typologies of spaces so that if I'm a sales guy who's loud and obnoxious, I can work in the way that I need to work, but not disrupt you, the, the coder or the engineer who needs to be heads down and focused. I'm very quiet. <laughs> exactly. So what can we do with the design of the space to more mimic how humans were actually meant to create and collaborate? But then also, how can we use technology to kind of engage them and make sure that they know what's going on in and around the building, right? Using those, those engagement technologies to say, well, you know what, Jacob? You know, you're a sports fan. Well, there's actually a, a Cubs game that Common Grounds or Industrious is providing uh, tickets to the membership with. So it's both sort of inside of the space, but also how can we use the things that we have inside of the space to... Uh, kind of meet the needs of the end user. But the biggest thing I think is the design of the space. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a little bit more human centric. It needs to engage the five senses. It needs to make people feel like they would actually want to go to the office and, and maybe even stay there for a little while. I literally, I get a BizNow newsletter every morning, like so many of us, that usually has 15 things to know today. And I just, on the way over here, read an article about how the next move for office is bringing nature indoors. And it was a bunch of trees behind like office, like Dilbert characters. Yeah. So yeah, like we are gonna be in zoos ultimately, I think, and we'll be on. <laughs> I think the big thing is is that people are starting to realize that if you want to have the best talent and you want to have the most productivity and you want to hit your goals, you need to provide a space where people can collaborate and work and, f and feel comfortable. And part of that is bringing those outdoor elements inside and making it feel like it's not just a place that is you know, oppressive and reminds you of office space. Well, yeah, remember in sixth grade when you would ask if you could have class outside? Oh, yeah. It's nice today. Can we go outside? Yeah. No. I still do that. <laughs> well, there's a rooftop. You can do that, yeah. actually. Now you have a rooftop and it has Wi-Fi.
So maybe final thoughts. Do you have any parting shots or any final proclamations you'd like to make? Any last say, last words? <laughs> no, I mean, I think my final words, I mean, this was really exciting and it was really nice to meet all of you guys. I think to, to kind of touch on the question that was asked, I think it's all about going out and seeing all the products. I mean, get your feet out there. It's we're, we're trying to educate as many people as we can on what co-working is now. And, you know, the more you guys know, the more that the future tenants can know. So. Uh, final thoughts for me, actually. Uh, this is the first time I've done one of these. Uh, I hope it didn't show too much. Uh, I did just jump off a plane from Denver. So I appreciate you guys sticking with me, and I appreciate you putting up with me talking around in circles sometimes and, uh, and really enjoying the sound of my own voice. So if, if you want to talk more, uh, you know, I, I'm going to be around for a little while. would love to just meet you guys and, and, uh, and shoot the breeze a little bit. But th thanks for putting up with me, and uh, thanks, you guys, at the, the folks at Disrupt Siri for, uh, for having me. Yeah, thanks, everybody.